you know, when it comes to control, you know, that's the, the, the what good cross-examiners can do by virtually punching the witness in, in, in the face with a prior inconsistent statement right off the bat um, to show, to teach that witness that if they try to cut corners, you're going to you're going to catch them on it. They've got a history of dishonesty. They've got a history of criminal behavior. They ins their knowledge and their ability to be a, a helpful witness on a given file is born out of the fact that they, they were indeed accomplices or co-conspirators on the case. But you better be confident that you can beat them on the facts because if you can't and you start your cross-examination giving an already bombastic, arrogant witness a win, well, you're going to be being chased by them for cover, despite their loyalty and their tattoos meant to signify their loyalty to each other. When they get into a position where they're going to either go down as a party to a homicide and a potential life sentence, and it's that, or they join Team Canada, uh, offer to give advice and, and agree to go into a, a non-glamorous life in the witness protection program, they're going to pick the latter. For a price, a certain class of witness will hang anybody out to dry. Uh, hey everyone, we're, uh, we're here to start with, uh, with our first podcast. We have a, a really great guest uh, joining us, uh, Kevin Westell. Kevin's uh, the chair of the CBA, Vancouver Criminal Justice, Justice uh, Subsection. He's a partner at the Pender litigation firm, and uh, he's taught at quite a few different uh, courses as well as uh, the University of Fraser Valley. Uh, welcome, Kevin. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. So I really am really interested to, uh, to ask you, what were you like as a kid? Because you have, you have so many accomplishments uh, now. Were you someone who was very like curious or were you, what were you like? Uh, you know, when I was a kid, um, I was uh, very into sports, you know, and I was competitive. Um, I was a bit of a big bookworm and a nerd as well and loved to read. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't say that there was anything about me that, um, that I was particularly predisposed to the law other than sort of I, I liked the idea of doing something that was a challenge and difficult and, mm -hmm. and required to use your mind and had competitive aspects to it. But, um, you know, other than being sort of, you know, really focused on sports and caring about sports, um, I was a pretty average kid. Yeah. Um, what kind of sports were you, were you interested in? Basketball. I was, um, I'm, I'm six foot four and, but I was a, I was about six foot one by the time I was in the seventh grade. I grew quite quickly. And uh, so basketball was a natural fit for me. And I was lucky to keep playing into university. I was a, I was a pretty good high school player. I was an average to below average um, university player, but I got a chance to get some of my school paid for playing for uh, Simon Fraser University and for a couple of years at the University of Manitoba. Wow, so that's awesome. Um, so how did how did the idea of becoming a lawyer kind of come into that? Was that something that were you around lawyers when you were a kid, or was it something you found out about uh, later on? Um, uh, one of my one of my high school coaches and, and a good friend of my um, a father of a good friend of mine was a a lawyer and a and a prosecutor, and that's where the interest in criminal law came. Um, you know, I liked the idea of, of, of doing something with, that was challenging and competitive. Um, and, and I have to admit to you that I didn't, <laughs> I got lucky. I think that I, I went into law and really, really loved it, but I can't say that I gave him that much thought into it. I sort of thought, Oh, I'll try to be a lawyer you know i i sort of wanted to do something that was a conventional career choice in the sense of like a doctor or a lawyer mm -hmm. um and i knew that being a medical doctor was not ever going to be for me based on um you know i wasn't really one for the sciences and uh but i love to talk and i i love to i love the 
I've always loved the sort of mental challenge of, of, of law. So it ended up being a good fit. That's why I ended up going into law, but there wasn't much, you know, my father was a firefighter. My mother still works uh, at a bank um, or credit union, sorry. But there, so there wasn't much of a sort of a legal mm -hmm. stream in my family, put it that way. When you said, so it's really interesting hearing that you were, you were really active, but you're also really into reading and books and, and kind of improving your knowledge as a kid. Um, were those books kind of related to law or were they just kind of like in general, like fiction really. or nonfiction? You no, know, I was sort of, I was sort of all over the place. I read a lot of books mm -hmm. about athletes, you know, not, mm -hmm. not exactly. Um, you know, the autobiography of Charles Barkley isn't exactly the, uh, the high point of literature. <laughs> but at a young age, I liked reading about um, people in sports that I admired. Mm. Um, some of those books were pretty good, like the, you know, thoughtful athletes or, or coaches like Phil Jackson. Like, I think there's a lot to be gained from reading about mm. some of their experiences. But I just liked, um, I just liked to read. I've always enjoyed reading and I still uh, try to find time to read despite the fact that um, anybody who's doing this profession is forced to read a ton of stuff for mm -hmm. work but I do think it's important to try to find a way to continue to read for pleasure as well I think it's good for your brain and it's good to read it's good for your brain to read for reasons other than your career yeah do you have any good book uh, recommendations uh, lots um, what did I read I just read an excellent book which was a biography of the American diplomat, um, Richard Holbrook, called Our Man. Uh, that's excellent. I, 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 by George Packer, I highly recommend that to anyone who's sort of interested in 20th century politics. And I've, I, I'm a big fan of the, I read mostly nonfiction. I'm a big fan of the writer Lawrence Wright, who writes for the New Yorker, and he's written a couple of books recently um some of it about he's written a book called the looming tower that sort of mm -hmm. talks about the lead up to to 9 11 and the the sort of growth and development of extremist uh, islam and he's also written a great he's a texan and he's written a great book called god bless texas and it just talks about or god save texas i think uh, that talks about um just sort of the political and social climate in Texas and how it's becoming um, a more liberal state after being for, mm. for many, many years, a very um, Republican uh, mm. yeah. minded place. So it's, those are great books. I'd re recommend them to anyone. I heard, I heard California was a, a red state at one point and now it's deep, deep, deep blue. Um, yeah. Th there's a lot in that book about um, in Lawrence Wright's last book about Texas, about the, um, the parallels between Texas and California. Like that's a lot, mm. that's a big piece of what he writes about. So uh, it's very interesting. I'm early on in that book, I have to say, but um, I'm just a big have fan you, of, of, of Wright as a writer. Have you heard of uh, a lot of these influencers going over to Texas, like Joe Rogan? I didn't know that the influencers were, that, that many influencers were heading to Texas, but I'm not surprised. I mean, it's sort of a, hit, a hotbed of, mm -hmm. um, in the tech world right now. And, you know, you've got um, South by Southwest being sort of this, this huge media hot point every year. And mm. so I'm not surprised that more and more people are sort of basing themselves in mm -hmm. Texas. Yeah. So uh, I guess to, to go back to you were, so once you chose to be a lawyer um, and you were just kind of like doing your articling and stuff, how did you have any mentors or was there any material that you kind of looked towards uh, when you were just starting off? Um, I, I love, I, I collect sort of books on trial advocacy. Um, and so I love to read about, you know, you know, the methods and techniques of cross examination and witness examination mm -hmm. and, and being persuasive and things like that. And I've got a bookshelf over there that's, that's filled with them. Some of them are great and some of them are just um, not as great, but part of, part of the collection. You know, I, I was lucky to have a, a mentor in Glenn Orris uh, who I articled for and he gave me an opportunity to 
work as a sole practitioner, but out of his office with a with mm. like a highly subsidized rent and lots of opportunities to work on um, big, ugly murder files and, and, and homicide files. So he was a mentor to me early on. Um, and, and, you know, I, I worked with Glenn many times and I've worked with other lawyers and I've, I've been lucky to have a ton of different mentors over the years. And I've been lucky to sort of, um, or I think I'm fortunate that I have a genuine interest in trial practice and the combination of, of wanting to read about it, get better at it, get feedback on my performance from, from lawyers I work with, uh, especially as a young lawyer and, and judges occasionally uh, and combined with having mentors like Glenn uh, and a few other lawyers. Um, I've been lucky to have a good experience around mentorship and growth. Yeah, that's really good. Cause I, I was thinking like, um, as a young lawyer, like law is a lot about being an expert, right? So mm-hmm. as a, as a young lawyer, you want to be able to be vulnerable and ask these questions, but also you want to be seen as an expert. So it's kind of a tricky. tricky it is tricky. You know, that's, that's a great point that, that doesn't get talked about a lot is that it is a tricky um, balance to play because you've got to find a way to get experience to get better. Mm-hmm. But you know, when you look at it from the client's perspective, no client is crazy about <laughs> the idea yeah. of being yeah. anybody's learning opportunity. Um, and so you take, I think if you're, you know, the way I approached it was to try to really put myself out there with respect to doing as much junior work as I could, but also making mm-hmm. sure that I took on as many cases, as many sort of tough legal aid cases as possible uh, where you know, to put it bluntly, you know, a more, more senior and experienced lawyers aren't, weren't interested in taking those cases. So Mm. uh, for the, for better or for worse, I was likely the best that somebody in that situation was going to be able to, to, Mm -hmm. to get in terms of a lawyer. So, and then you just do your best and you make mistakes and you learn from those mistakes and you try to do better the next time. I mean, to me, I think that learning in the law is, you know, you can read books and you can watch people, but I can't speak for everybody. But for me, the experience of of doing it, making mistakes or realizing, you know, while you're doing it, that it could be done better and then learning and, and growing the next time around, that's, that's the way you get better as a lawyer. You know, no matter, I suppose other people might have different experiences with it and, 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 and learn differently, but I am very much an experiential learner. So it's been, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you read about, you know, how a cross-examination can go wrong. There's, there's no better teacher than the experience of having it go wrong yeah. <laughs> and having the outcome affected by, by your mistakes. So um, luckily for me, I think that happens a lot less frequently, but um, um, you continue to learn. I think if you're doing it right, you're you, as a lawyer you've got to be a lifelong career long learner yeah yeah no it's really good advice um so i saw that after you article with glenn orris you went right into having your own practice was that partially because glenn gave you a lot of freedom to uh like you were saying to kind of do your own stuff yeah i mean i was i was essentially what the arrangement was was that um glenn gave me free rent for a year and then my rent was extremely low after that now i didn't have any use of the support staff or anything like that but i didn't have a lot of clients either so i was around and and able to work with glenn on big files that were in the office and i also had the freedom you know i wasn't a paid employee so if there wasn't any work to be done on one of glenn's files i was down at one of the provincial courthouses trying to um you know, see if anybody needed my services or talk to talking to duty counsel to see if there were uh, clients that needed help that didn't have lawyers already and trying to build my own practice that way. And so another, you know, uh, I I had other mentors sort of in that space that were, that were people that were really good to me. I mean, I was an eager, very junior lawyer at the time looking for work and hungry, hungry to get my hands on work. And I was lucky to make relationships with, um, a number of lawyers. One of them was a lawyer named Mark Gervin, um, who at the time, his practice was mainly at Main Street, and he really helped me to get my own practice 
going. And I was lucky that the provincial, the Vancouver Provincial Courthouse at Triple Two Main Street was very, still very busy at that time. It's not as busy anymore. Um, and I was lucky that people gave me opportunities and I tried to do the best I could with them. Yeah, that's really good. And that's also something I've always wondered is like, when you're just starting off as a, like a new lawyer, how do you stand out? And I've heard a, a couple other lawyers also say something similar where they would kind of like go to the courthouse and, you know, yeah. really try to network and stuff. But it, like in today's climate, especially with not even being able to probably go to the courthouse right now. Yeah. How do you, how do you stand out amongst like so many people online? It's, it, you know, it's really tough to, tough to do. I think there's still a culture in criminal law in Vancouver anyway, where you're not going to get a lot of, as a brand new lawyer, you can't sort of just rely on your website to get you going. Mm -hmm. Like and maybe this is old fashioned thinking, but my understanding, and we have, you know, junior associates here that we obviously are, you know, trying to get their, help them get their practices going in, in difficult circumstances uh, with the pandemic. But, I think you do have to get down there and make still as a junior lawyer make relationships. Like you have to put yourself out there as available to do the grunt work as a junior. You have to be willing to take um, the same kind of cases I was talking about cases that are on legal aid that don't pay much, but offer an opportunity. Um, and the combination of doing that and sticking it out. I mean, it just sort of, there's a lot of people and I don't, um, I don't begrudge them for a second for doing this that end up, you know, they, they can't, they don't want to stick it out um, and grind as a criminal defense lawyer. They would rather take a job with the government for the crown as a prosecutor where there's a steady paycheck mm -hmm. or a job at a, you know, at a civil firm where there's a steady paycheck as well. And it's, it's some part of being in criminal law is, you know, a huge part of it is learning and getting better and developing experience. But part of it is, do you have the grit Mm -hmm. to stick out like the financial difficulty of the early years. Like, can you keep your low, can you keep your financial expectations low, keep your overhead low, find a way to make enough money to survive and, and see a path forward and stick with this. And, you know, you don't make a lot of money. And my understanding is it's the same in Ontario and all over the, the promise that for most lawyers, you don't make a lot of money in your first five years. That was certainly my experience. And if you can stick it or stick it out to the 10 year mark and you've, you've, done everything you can, then um, your practice starts to hopefully open up. And I've, I've ha been very lucky to have that experience, knock on wood. So hopefully that continues. But um, yeah. yeah, so in terms of your question of how to stick out, um, it's tough. But I think what you have to do is try to make relationships with lawyers that need your help and lawyers that, um, and be visible um, to lawyers who get a call about a file that they don't want to take. Um, but you, most lawyers, you know, most decent lawyers don't want to just say no, like call someone else. They want to be able to say to someone, no, but I suggest you call this person, this person, or this person. Mm -hmm. And so you make the relationships so you end up getting those referrals. Um, and that's how you build a practice. I mean, you need to, at this, in this day and age, you need to augment those types of relationships by having some sort of a web presence. You know, maybe you're not paying mm -hmm. to have um, search engine optimization right off the bat, and maybe you're not, you know, putting up ads. But you need to have. I, I think in 2020, you need to be your clients or potential clients or clients' families need to be able to Google you and see oh, this is a lawyer mm -hmm. that's got some experience and reputation, and they've got. You know what ends up happening is the website ends up being your resume. And I think most clients have an expectation that they can view that, that online resume um, within, within a few minutes of, of speaking to you for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah, makes a lot of sense. You have to basically be like really entrepreneurial. Like you hear all these stories about like tech stuff, but, but lawyers have been doing it all along. <laughs> yeah. <basically. laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, we, that's the other thing, you know, the other piece about um, why a lot of people, I think, flee criminal defense. You know, it's usually you're running your own business or you're part of a very small business. And like any entrepreneur, there's a lot of work and effort that goes into just the concept of running a business. 
and at the same time as a as a lawyer you've got to develop you know you've got to have a second career of like developing your skills in the courtroom and your ability mm-hmm. and, and keeping updated on your knowledge of the evolution of the criminal law so you're really taking on two jobs neither of which is particularly well paid and i think the advantage for a lot of people with the crown is you're you don't have to worry about running the business of of the prosecution service you only have to worry about dealing with the files that land on your desk yeah so with all this stuff going on i know not only are you running your own law firm but you're you're active in all these other areas as well how do you balance life and work um that's always a struggle um you know i think You know, it's tough to do. I'm, I'm lucky that I love this job. I love doing what I do, and I love spending time outside of bankers' hours working on these files because they're interesting to me. But it is not a healthy thing to be that way all the time. So you have to be really intentional about time with loved ones and time for yourself in terms of getting exercise. Um, and pursuing hobbies and, and things outside of law. I think it ultimately makes you better. Make, it ultimately makes you perform better as a lawyer. Like that's the real truth mm. to it. But in terms of your health in general, I think it's not good to be sort of single-minded and, and constantly just focusing on your cases in your law business. And I think the mistake that people make is they schedule their career and then just say, well, my personal life and my health will just sort of slide into the cracks and it doesn't work that way. You have to be really intentional about making time for the people you care about, your spouse, your kids, and you've got to be really intentional about scheduling um, uh, workouts or self-care or whatever you want to call it. But you, you know, that's, you know, that's all I can really say to you is that you have to take as seriously as seriously as you take scheduling a court date, you have to you have to be this take the same uh, same serious approach to scheduling your personal time. Yeah, that makes sense. Like basically, have a really good relationship with your calendar. Absolutely, in, in all in all in all categories of of, of life experience. Yeah, um, so I want to get a little bit more into like trials and stuff. Sure. Um, so especially for younger lawyers, but this would work for both uh, Ian and yourself as well. Um, how do you know you did well after doing a cross-examination? Well, I mean, I think that you, I think you're measuring it in relation to, you know, to cross-examine well, you've got to go into it with not just the general objective of, 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 you know, helping win the case, but you know, you mm-hmm. want to have specific objectives. Like I want, you know, I need to get established this fact and this fact, and I need to wear down the witness points where I'm going to attack. And, and you can look at it looking, you know, backwards after you finished it and see um, how you th- think you did in relation to those specific objectives um i think you want to you need to develop and have a really tight and and specific sense of what your objectives are and and measure again measure the measure your success in that way because no matter how well you cross-examine someone it still may not be enough to turn the you know to affect the final verdict and it might be not it might not be enough um to have a perry mason moment and it usually isn't but i think you have to set goals around each and every cross-examination you do even if it's a it's a quick fact witness and then you have to sort of get a sense of what's what's realistic um have a sense of whether or not really what you're going to attempt with the witness is a bit of a hail mary because you know that's the only way it's worth trying because it's the only way to success in the context of this trial and then you've got to measure outcomes you know against those objectives and to some extent that analysis will be 
subjective and to some extent it will be objective which you know you can look at the transcript and see did he did i get him to concede the thing that i wanted him or her, he or she to concede or not but you know i think it's important as a criminal defense lawyer um you're going to lose a lot of cases the system is supposed to work that way that's part of what we do so to always define success around complete acquittal um, you're not going to have a very happy life or career. So, you know, setting reasonable and specific objectives about what you want to accomplish in a given cross-examination and then spending some time, you know, whether it's the natural exercise of spending some time thinking about those cross-examinations because you've got to, you've got to write and argue a, a closing argument that aligns with what you did or didn't accomplish in cross-examination. But even outside of that, when a trial is over, taking some time to think about what, you attempted and whether it worked and how you could have done it differently. I mean, that's, it's really having goals and then spending time reflecting on what worked and what didn't and why that's how you measure success or failure on a cross-examination in my books. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I guess to sum it up is like you, each case is going to be different. So each case is going to have their own goals and yep. you basically, you come up with a, a couple small goals that end up with a bigger result, which is what you want mm -hmm. to achieve in your end uh, statement. Yeah. I mean, I'm a firm believer and I, and maybe, I don't know if Ian agrees with this or not, but I've most senior lawyers I, I respect. I mean, most witnesses, no matter how complicated the case, it's really, and I'm not talking about expert witnesses, but it's really, it's seldom more than two or three points or facts that you're looking you know, there may be different ways, you know, you may cross examine them from a long time and you're, you're coming at a certain issue from different angles, but it's usually only two or three facts or points that really matter. And so getting real with yourself and getting specific about those objectives and how you've, you know, how you've, um, how you've done in relation to those facts and those, those essential issues, that's how you measure success and failure. Yeah, no, that's a, that sounds like a really good way of doing it. Um, Ian, I think you had a question about um, the one of the cases uh, Kevin has done. Um, I think what um, I was interested in, we were going to talk about um, a class of witnesses uh, uh, called the Vatrovic case, an old case that uh, dealt with some uh, uh, witnesses who tend to be a more disreputable character. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was going to ask you sort of in your experience, um, how does that case play a factor and what type of witnesses to, uh, does that case deal with? Um, well, Vetrovec is, a, is really the, the case that, um, that deals with how judges are meant to warn juries about how to, the level of caution that they're to apply in evidence that comes with a certain class of, of what the Supreme Court of Canada likes to call it, unsavory witnesses. And essentially, these are witnesses that are of a variety. They're usually criminals themselves, sometimes, but not always. They are witnesses that in addition to being criminals, they may actually have received benefits from the police um, in exchange for their um, testimony, which is uh, conceptually, there's nothing as long as the, those benefits are, are disclosed to the defense, there's nothing illegal or unsavory about that practice. But um, because of the danger and the concern about wrongful convictions and the danger and concern related to the idea that, you know, for a price, um, a certain class of witness will hang anybody out to dry, you know, there's a special warning, a Vetrovic warning, uh, the content of which is set out in the Vetrovic case, that is essentially what, the substance of which is how a jury is to be warned about being careful with that evidence. And, and to keep in mind when assessing that evidence that they're not to treat it like, um, treat it the same as a witness that uh, is a normal non-criminal person that's never, Done anything wrong, and there's been a number of cases that have come since Vetrovec, um, and and it's important to note that you know that case 
is about a jury trial, but the same law applies in non-jury settings. And it really, it's a set of instructions uh, that a judge is meant to um, remind him or herself of when they're assessing a, uh, assessing the evidence of an unsavory witness in the, in a non-jury setting as well. And and um, would you you'd include a accomplice? Absolutely. And, yes. And then somebody that's got a history of maybe lying to the police or the court. Definitely. Yep. Or a uh, uh, long criminal record might be one of the. For sure, all of those things, and sometimes all of those factors are uh, present in a single witness. You know, we have a lot of, I suppose most provinces do, but we've had a number of high profile um, organized crime prosecutions and trials in this province, and you get witnesses that end up being cultivated by the police and and who essentially it's exactly that they've got a history of dishonesty they've got a history of criminal behavior they ins their knowledge and their ability to be a, a helpful witness on a given file is born out of the fact that they they were indeed accomplices or co-conspirators on the case and they're given and they're being offered either full immunity or some limited level of immunity a reduction in sentence for example for coming to court and saying look i was involved um, this was the plan and, and essentially they are, you know, from the perspective of the accused that's on trial, very dangerous witnesses. And so um, in those cases, you can see how and why a vetrovic warning of a, of a particular strength is, is very important in a jury trial. And you can see why having a particular approach or st and strategy and, and a level of rigor in preparing and executing a cross-examination with respect to those witnesses is essential to, to, to defending your client in those cases. Um, and do you need, because of the, uh, the reference to cooperation for that type of witness, do you need to sort of come up with a strategy that looks not only at that witness, but the whole case to see where the cooperation is, because that's where the prosecutor is going to try to convince the judge or jury that you can still believe. Absolutely. Right. It's, it's, you know, a poorly planned and executed cross-examination will do the very thing that, that, that you sort of alluded to is just sort of going and attacking and, and, and inflating about and cross-examining somebody in general about a being a rat, being a, being a criminal who's just looking to save their own hide. But if you're not able to actually attack, the corroborating features as well, uh, you're not going to get very far with that kind of approach because the, a good prosecutor will say, listen, like I'm not trying to tell you, jury, that this guy is a great guy or should be getting the key to the city. I'm trying to tell you that he's got something to say because he was there and saw it himself. And the reasons why you can and should believe him are not just because he says so, because his story matches up with this piece of physical evidence or this piece of this account from an independent non vetrovic witness. So it's exactly as Ian has described. You have to have a total approach where you attack the vetrovic, but are prepared to attack or, and at least undermine the corroborative evidence. These, these cases are, are, and I always say this, they're all about corroboration. And when these, these cases are being built, um, you know, especially when they're long, you know, multi-year investigations by, you know, the special units like the CFSEU and, and RCMP's IHIT division, the work that they're doing, most of the time they spend is not in, in onboarding Petrovic witnesses. It's the work of finding and establishing and proving corroboration. So that's where you've really got to focus your efforts. Um, in terms of the uh, the uh, unsavory witness, how key is he uh, trying to figure out the motive of why he may be uh, giving evidence? Usually the motive is fairly, it, it's key, but it's usually fairly easily uncovered in the sense that <laughs> you end up finding out that there's not much honor among thieves when you when you deal with the Vetrovic witnesses and in the sense that ultimately people in the organized crime game often despite their loyalty and their tattoos 
meant to signify their loyalty to each other. When they get into a position where they're going to either go down as a party to a homicide and a potential life sentence, and it's that, or they join Team Canada, uh, offer to give advice and, and agree to go into a, a non-glamorous life in the witness protection program, they're going to pick the latter. I mean, it's just a genuine, it's just a, it's a matter of, of human nature for better or for worse. And I, I make no, I don't mean to sort of diminish that idea. I mean, it's just a natural extension of, of people's desire to have a life and have a level of freedom that they will cooperate in those circumstances. And, 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 you know, particularly groups like the combined forces, special enforcement unit of the, of the, um, RCMP and I hit, they, they're very good at spotting people that end up feeling leveraged. They feel leveraged and they feel perhaps left out or underappreciated um, or unsupported by their criminal colleagues. And that's when, you know, a police force approaches them, uh, gives them a sense of the kind of trouble they could be facing, gives them a sense of how cooperation could mean a way out for them. And sometimes they cooperate and they, um, they're happy they did so and and lots of times they cooperate and they they wish they hadn't um and it's not just about personal safety they just wish they hadn't but for better or for worse they do end up cooperating quite often and and you know if there is another motive an ulterior motive beyond just wanting to save their bacon it's important to have a, a sense of that for sure ian um, you see often that uh when a witness does decide to cooperate uh, by doing that, they in some cases end up uh, giving a statement that conflicts what they said at the beginning. Yes. In the sense yeah. that you know, when they're first arrested, they'll give one version, but then when the cooperation uh, is going to benefit them, another version is what surfaces. Exactly. Yeah, you see that, that quite often. I mean, and, and if it's done, if the, if the sort of post-cooperation statement is done well, the interviewer will make a point of of allowing the veteran witness an opportunity to explain, hey, here's why I lied before. Sorry about that. Here's why I'm telling you the truth now. Um, and when they fail to do that, and you've just got a conflict between the two statements, it's much it's much easier to cross examine them in a in a more damaging way. But um, yeah, typically, typically they do have, there is some kind of divergence from what they said initially and what they're, and it's usually, Ian, I would say less about a complete contradiction and more about all of a sudden they're adding all sorts of detail that wasn't there on the front end, which, which can provide avenues for cross-examination. Um, in, in terms of the exact detail of how the event would have occurred, um, do you see often, depending on the factual circumstances, that you'll need to get into kind of a, a direct attack on their version of the events in the sense, for example, um, if it's a, an accomplice, you want to bring out whether this accomplice actually had the opportunity and motive to commit the crime themselves. Yes, example. absolutely. And on the other hand, if you're, if you're not dealing with an accomplice who was there, but you're dealing with, say, a an informant at the jail who allegedly took a confession, you want to get into, did that um, uh, informant at the jail have some other source of the information, the details, mm -hmm. media, uh, police, maybe somewhere else? Yes, exactly. I mean, I think that there's, there's more or less been, in BC anyway, it's very rare to see um, a jailhouse informant type situation anyway as a matter of policy they seldom mm. seldom even go there um, yeah, the reliability of that i guess the, the reliability and there was a there was a lot of criticism of, um and I'm, I'm sorry that i can't remember but on one of the commission reports that fall into one of the wrongful convictions and i'm not sure if it was Sofano or another but they basically um have said that it's 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 seldom if ever a good idea to pursue those lines of 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 investigation um and i think i've never seen one in my career i've done you know i've been around that long or as long as you ian but i've done a lot of homicide work 
uh, as a junior originally, and then in the last five years, sort of running my own files. And I've never run in into one. Um, and I think if you did see one, it's exactly as you described. It would have to be heavily corroborated for them to even think about running it because it's so rife with with sort of the odor of uh, wrongful conviction. Um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the first part of your question. Oh, first part was in terms of uh, uh, an accomplice. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah definitely the, you, you drill down on that, on the concept of whether or not this person is, in fact, the perpetrator who has found a way to um, now sort of fool the police into, uh, into a version of events where, in fact, they were the perpetrator and now they're going to get out from under this whole allegation by, by putting all of the, the weight and the allegation on, on their accomplice. I think that I have found that in terms of in major crime investigations, um, the police are, are very vigilant about the concern of something to go to tr going to trial where there's a real, if there's any kind of a legitimate opportunity to make that claim, um, uh, and do it fraudulently they they generally don't go to trial on those um, unless they've got as we you know we keep coming back to the c word but heavy corroboration that shows in fact that they even though they had the opportunity that there's heavy corroboration to say that they didn't take that opportunity and it was the one was the other person that did it um, getting into the uh, prosecution their decision to proceed um, is that a strategic decision like how far you get into negotiating with them and giving the sort of negative information you have on the uh, a discreditable witness or how far you go into that? Yeah, I mean, I think that you want to be as rigorous as you possibly can be in, in, in diving into what you can get in terms of their history. Now, going beyond your question for a second, there's a lot of work to be done in see seeking out other sources of background information beyond disclosure, you know, trying to find through registries, uh, through court registries, for instance, negative information about the witness from family court proceedings or from um, proceedings in, in other jurisdictions, like in the States and things like that, where they've gotten themselves into trouble in other places and the affidavits that support those that are a matter of public record. But in terms of dealing with the crown, you've got to do everything you can to get anything that's relevant that they have their hands on. And that can include um, disclosure involving the handling of those witnesses while they're sort of in witness protection awaiting trial. What have they done that is discreditable um, and goes to their credibility? What have they done or said potentially about the offense to their handlers um, that isn't necessarily a statement? but was, was information received by the, by the police that would tend to, to question their, their character or their, or their credibility on, on facts. So you've got, to, you've got to dive in there and you've got to be rigorous in seeking that from the Crown. And if necessary, you've got to be prepared to make disclosure applications um, and litigate those things. Litigate them as third-party records when it comes to sort of situations when um, the witness protection unit has information and claims. Look, it's not relevant. It's not investigation type material. But you've got to you've got to chase down whatever information you can, and you owe that to your client. Um, do you ever face particular problem areas where you want to cross examine on the background of the uh, the witness in question, but the background sort of covers your own client as well, such as affiliation with gangs and stuff, and you have to make a Choice of whether you, how far you bring that out. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. You've got to be careful about exactly. Um, well, Vetchvik witnesses can be volatile, so many of them um, are taking every opportunity, even if it's sort of beyond the scope of the question you've asked, to implicate your client in. You know, so you know you've got to. You've got a Vetrovic witness that's a gang member and you're going to go after him for all the nasty things that he's done in the past. Well, if your client was a part of those nasty things, uh, many Vetrovic will gleefully take any opportunity they can to make sure that the jury is reminded that, hey, 
your client over there in the box, he was there with me for all those uh, robberies or home invasions or break and enters or, you know, international drug dealing escapades. So you're very right about that. And you can bring into, even if you've got a, a great ruling at the outset that certain things about your client's character or affiliation with certain gangs shouldn't be part of, of the Crown's case, you can inadvertently open the door for all that information to slide in and be properly before the jury if, if you ask the wrong questions in the wrong way to a veteran. Now, sometimes it's just, it's just a matter, and I'm dealing with a case coming up like this, where it's like, at the end of the day, the only way for me to attack this witness is to open the door to allow that kind of information in. And as long as you're making a choice around that, as opposed to sort of haphazardly having it happen, um, and you talk to your client and you explain to them why that's part of the game plan, sometimes that's the way you've got to you've got to go with it. But um, you know, whenever you can, you want to avoid bringing that kind of stuff in before the jury. Um, uh, what about um, uh, in terms of? Uh, the vetrovic warning, even with the vetrovic warning, do you have any concern doing a case that uh, a judge or jury might be looking at um, a witness who's an associate testifying against the accused and what maybe being predisposed to mm -hmm. the evidence? Because why would someone testify against a friend or an associate unless it were true? Definitely. I mean, that's one reason why, uh, stepping back from that, you may, with certain organized crime cases, and especially in, in, in jurisdictions where there's, you know, a, a popular expression through the press or whatever that, that, that uh, the scourge of gang life is, is affecting day-to-day -day life in that community, you want to potentially explore a challenge for cause at the jury selection level to make sure that you've got a, se a selection of jurors that are able to be objective about the case and your client, even if they were to find out your client was a member of a gang. So, I mean, there's a, there's probably a limit on, on the actual value of that, but it's a worthwhile exercise in some, in some cases to, to, uh, to the extent we're allowed to in Canada to vet the jury for that concern at the front end in a general way. But I agree. I mean, I think that's one, one reason why here in BC, um, we will often in these cases seek the reelection on even a homicide to a judge alone trial. Now my understanding from the, the national committee and law reform work I've done in talking to colleagues from Ontario, that it's extremely difficult in Ontario to get, other than in sort of very complicated NCRMD type cases to get a reelection to judge alone on a, on a, on a murder case. But um, there's a, f there's a much more liberal view of that with respect to the crown here. And I think some of that is driven by um, delay paranoia. And in a lot of cases, like the mm -hmm. crown is quite happy to say, okay, we'll reelect. We're going to have to be, there's less, things for us to trip over here in terms of bad character of the accused. We can do this in a shorter time frame, and we don't have to, and, and the defense's concerns are allayed usually that you're very right, the concern that your client's ultimately going to just be convicted by association and the, and the jury won't even need to concern themselves with the actual facts of the case. <laughs> Am I right about that, Ian? Is that your experience that there, it's tough to get a reelection on a, on a murder in Ontario or have you, have you heard otherwise? Never heard that happening often. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, in terms of these type of witness, sort of strategies with these type of witnesses, uh, uh, I mean, we're presuming, I guess, they're people you think uh, are giving potentially a false version of the events. Yep. So, do you sort of tailor techniques to try to uncover that, such as, for example, like highly detailed questions? Uh, a rapid pace, changing order, are there particular things like that that you think are affecting? Mm -hmm. Well, every case is different, and I think it's important to to give uh, some real thought to what order you, how you order your cross-examination, how you organize your cross-examination. Um, cross-examinations are like a story, so you should try to have a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, and so, you know, if you've got 
three areas that you think you're very likely to have some level of success with to hit them all three at the beginning and then have the rest of the cross examination sort of peter out after that it's not it's not good stagecraft and i don't think it's very persuasive um, even though the transcript will may ultimately have the same data in it at the end of the day um, so i think you want to pace and plan your cross examination so that there are winnable issues or winnable points in favor of your client um, at the beginning, the middle, and, and you end on a high point, obviously, as, as, as well. Um, I think there's a, there's a, it's very important to have a strategy around trying to draw your, the witness into credibility problems around ancillary issues. Like that's often where these things are won. So sort of trying to find a way to push them into denying things that they shouldn't be denying, that you can prove, even if they don't aren't germane to what happened. If you can sort of prove this witness to be a liar or someone who at least um, is cavalier about the truth in any area, that's going to help. Even if the even if that witness sticks to their story. Uh, on the main pieces and the and the sort of most material material parts of their evidence, that's going to give you a credible shot at, at being able to, with a straight face, saying, "Look, you can't you can't rely on this guy. I don't care what what he said or how much his his um, testimony sort of aligns with common sense. He's just someone that is cavalier with the truth, and you've got my client over there whose whole life is on the line, and you've got a standard to meet of of." Uh, beyond a reasonable doubt that's extremely high so remembering that some of the art form is finding ways to push and coax um a vetrovic witness into areas where they might be inclined to lie to protect somebody else you know they've got a they've got all sorts of lines where sure i'll tell you the truth about this but no matter what i'm not going to talk about my buddy so and so and so forcing them to confront that, seeing if they'll lie to protect that person in a way that you can then show them to be lying or, or shading the truth. That's sort of the. Uh, or if they, if they, if they um, uh, try to avoid that bit by saying, I don't remember that part. Exactly. Then you can exactly. make some kind of argument that you're not remembering stuff that uh, you don't want to uh, specifically. Exactly. Exactly. So I think to the, once you've been around long enough to have done a few of them, that's that's where a lot of your attention goes as a cross examiner. You know, you've got to walk a fine line where a judge might be like, you know, why are we talking about this other incident th three years before? Mm -hmm. So you've got to find a way to be succinct, um, be dynamic, keep the courtroom, you know, for lack of a better word, entertained and engaged, and keep it tied to what's relevant about what didn't, didn't happen, you know, that is the subject of the charge, but you need to be prepared to go beyond the allegation itself to, to mine out credibility problems. And those are the weak spots that I think sometimes the crown and the police, sorry, the blind spots that they fail to see, you know, they are so focused on, can we prove that so-and-so shot so-and-so on this date? And do we have something to corroborate what this guy says? They don't always see it coming when you've got, um, strong cross-examination on credibility related to other issues. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can take the the crown and the witness by surprise in a, in a completely ethical way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, at, at the start of a cross-examination like that, would you try to start off uh, with something significant, if you could, like a significant discrepancy or a theme of a motive? And try to start off something that gets people attention right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I might. Yeah, there's there's two ways to think about this. Well, there's a lot of ways to think about the start of cross examination. On the one hand, um, you know, you've got really with the Vetrovic, we're mainly d sort of concerned with the idea of a destructive cross examination. But mm -hmm. often, if if you there are constructive elements to your cross examination where you actually want certain facts that this witness has to offer to support your theory. So you know, if you've got constructive pieces where you want that witness to agree with you on things that you think they might agree with you, you probably want to get that 
accomplish with them early on before you got to throw any punches at them. That's sure. something I always, I always find difficult is uh, uh, there's an inconsistent approach between attacking the witness at the beginning with a yes. strong point versus getting out the positive things. And, and you can't do both really. Uh, is the problem. It's, it, it's, it's a, that's it's where the art comes in, right? I mean, I think I totally agree with you, Ian. It's always a, a matter of subjective choice as opposed to being like, there's a, there's a, there's a, an algorithm here, but, but other times, you know, going back to your original question, if you've got a very confident and strident um, witness and a witness that is really trying to dominate the courtroom by, by, by virtually punching the witness in, in, in the face with a prior inconsistent statement right off the bat um, to show, to teach that witness that if they try to cut corners, you're going to, you're going to catch them on it. So you're teaching them like, you better give me what I want or else I'm going to make you look like a fool here and establishing that in an aggressive way early on with some witnesses is, is the right way to approach it because you can sort of, um, it's almost like um, rope a dope, like with Muhammad Ali, like if, if, if you can get into a fight with a witness early and they tire themselves out and ultimately come out looking foolish or looking unreasonable, it may be that they're so exhausted with the idea of, of, of having to go toe to toe with you when you have all the information they don't, that they fall in line and are sort of uh, prepared to do whatever it takes to just get out of the witness box quickly. So agreeing, if agreeing with this examiner is, is gonna be the fastest route to me getting out of this courtroom, fine. I don't care if I help the crown anymore. I'm just going to give this guy what he wants. So he'll leave me alone. Sometimes that's, that's an element of that is, is part of a successful cross as well. I've seen that for doing something like that, showing them they're a master of the facts. And if they view you as a master of the facts of the case, they'll be kind of reluctant to take you on. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, but you better be confident that you can beat them on the facts. Cause if you can't, and you start your cross-examination giving an already bombastic, arrogant witness a win, well, you're gonna be, you're gonna be chasing them for cover or being chased by them for cover for the rest of the cross-examination. Right. You can also, in some cases, use some kind of um, thing that might be viewed as like an Achilles heel for the witness or something that's a pressure point like that. Cross-examine them on them, but leave parts of it. Yes. Uh, and then if they give you difficulty, bring it back. Absolutely. More questions, and then they get the idea that, well, uh, if they don't, be, if they're difficult with you, then you'll be difficult with them, sort of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a great, you know, when it comes to control, you know, that's the, the, the what good cross-examiners can do. You know, the ones that I define as cross-examiners that I admire, it's less about can they sort of yield a, Perry Mason moment at the drop of a hat. It's about, can they use facts in exactly the way that you've described, Ian, where they say, if things start to go a different way, way they don't like, can they quickly through, through asking the right questions at the right time, steer this witness back to a topic that's uncomfortable for them and then mm -hmm. keep them in line. And, and, you know, we may be getting a little inside baseball for your average viewer, but mm -hmm. uh, you're speaking, Ian is speaking a language that I completely understand and, and it don't resonates watch. with me as a cross-examiner yeah. we don't watch out people will watch some of this and know the, the tricks <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly um, uh, but uh, I, was, I was wondering in terms of uh, this type of witness um uh choice of when you have the choice of judge and jury um are there factors that would sway you one way or the other for example if you thought um either that your client wasn't going to testify or that you, for example, you thought that there wasn't much cooperation, would that lead you to a judge alone? If you thought- uh, Yeah, I mean, I think every case is different as you know, but I, I agree those will definitely lead you to that. You know, I, I think it's fairly conventional witness, but I tend, sorry, it's fairly conventional um, knowledge, but I tend to agree that if you're in a situation where your client is not going to testify and, and can't really viably testify, it, the default position is you're better off um, judge alone. And the judges are trained to apply 
the law properly and to not put any any real stake in the fact that your client is exercising his right to remain silent and his right to have the crown prove the case. And I think um, that is a truism. That, I mean, the, the murder trial that I got an acquittal on, the last one I got an acquittal on a year and a half ago, it was that very situation. And I can't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying nothing about, in, in making this comment about whether I believe my client was should have been found guilty or not. But I do believe based on my client's background and physical presentation that I'm not so confident we would have gotten an acquittal had it been with a jury and for all sorts of, of, of unlawful reasons that he may have been convicted. But we had a fair judge who ultimately said at the end of the day, look, um, I think you probably did this, but based on the extent to which this case relies on Betrovic evidence, and the, and, and the way that that testimony went, I'm, I'm simply unable to convict you to a life sentence uh, on the basis of that evidence. I'm simply not at proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And I think it's, you know, you, we, we don't know, we're never, we're never gonna have the ability to get into a jury room because we're lawyers, but I think that juries, I have a suspicion that juries tend to be less concerned about that and tend to actually accept a, a failure of the accused to, to testify as positive proof of their guilt. I, I, maybe that's over cynical, but I think that's, I do believe that. Mm -hmm. um, did you have any questions, uh, David? Yeah, so no, this is really interesting. I was just kind of like, I didn't want to break the flow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, so Ian was telling me about um, there was something that was passed recently where you can't just kick out a jury member uh, because you want to. Now there has to be like a whole like process uh, and reasons behind that. Um, do you think do you think that's going to affect decisions in the future because it's going to be more difficult to uh, to select the people you want on the jury? Oh right, yeah. There is there was a change in the law now that. That you're no you're no longer um, peremptory challenges have uh, are gone now, which means you used to be able to sort of take a look at at someone, maybe ask them a question or two, or 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 read what their job was and where they lived, and be able to say uh, no thanks. And those days are now gone, and now you sort of have um, have to take the first twelve witnesses that you get. Um, and I think, I think it is going to affect things. I mean, you know, not to go too far down that road, you know, the reason for that change in the law was a case out of Saskatchewan involving, uh, and there was an, a popular allegation that it was a white accused on trial and that he deliberately, through the peremptory challenge process, his lawyer deliberately kept uh, indigenous jurors off the jury uh, and it was an indigenous victim and that through that process um, an unfair result being an acquittal um, stemmed from that um, you know the issue I have with that is that I've actually found that more typically it is a racialized person in the prisoner's box mm -hmm. And typically, as a lawyer, I'm doing everything I can to make sure there aren't too many white people in the jury so that the accused is actually getting an opportunity to be tried by a jury uh, of his or her peers to the fullest extent you can. So to me, I'm, I'm concerned with where this takes us. And if we end up with... Um, a result that's totally contrary to the spirit of the change in the law. Um, you know, whether we end up evolving towards a, uh, what you call a Batson process that they have in the States where you can essentially, you know, question or challenge juries as being racially um, unbalanced. You know, we, we, time will tell as to whether or not the law um, goes in that way. But in terms of how it sits right now, um, I'm not happy with the change in the law and I think it's going to be problematic for 
in certain jurisdictions for racialized people on trial to get a get um, to have the appearance of a fair trial. Mm-hmm. Put it that way. What's your opinion on uh, doing trials by Zoom? If that's something that's going to possibly be happening for the next couple months. Well, you know, I've spoken on on this topic in in a number of forums and was just speaking on it last week at the Uniform Law Conference of Canada and and I've done participated in some CLEs on this and sort of to back up from a direct answer to your question, my thought is that we really need to start with moving as many things other than a trial to Zoom first, right? I mean, I think um, a lot of bail hearings can happen by Zoom. I think a lot of sentencing hearings um, for, for relatively minor offenses can happen by Zoom. Almost anything um, where a witness is not going to be examined can happen by Zoom and frankly should happen by Zoom with the consent of the parties. And certainly, um, I'd be interested to hear what you think of this, Ian. I think a lot of um, pretrial conferences, case management conferences, trial management conferences, whatever, I'm not sure, they call them different things in different jurisdictions, but those types of appearances and and minor scheduling appearances, that should all go virtually. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna clear out a lot of courtroom time and a lot of court resources uh, Mm -hmm. so that, you know, efficiencies are brought to the system and and, and really the, the, the smooth running of the courts is improved. I have a lot of concern about any, any court matter that involves the cross-examination of a witness moving to Zoom. I'm not suggesting that it can't be done. And with the consent of the parties, um, if an accused person, you know, with informed that's informed wants to consent to that. I don't see a real problem in that, but having accused people forced to into trials against their will, where all of a sudden the judge is making the credibility analysis over zoom. I find that problematic. You know, we're in a situation where witness accommodation occurs. So certain vulnerable witnesses are allowed uh, to testify outside the courtroom uh, on application from time to time. And I think that even that can be problematic. Uh, in certain in certain um, circumstances, but to me, um, and Crown and Defense tend to differ on this point. I think it's important that an examiner and that an accused have an opportunity to see in front of them, and that the judge be able to see the full extent of the of the witness's demeanor uh, when they're attacked on their credibility. I, mean, I just I'm I'm of that view, and maybe that's an old-fashioned view, but I think. Um, I'm pretty, I'm very firm on that view. And I just don't think we need to move to all these trials to Zoom when we haven't figured out a way to put almost everything else there that, that belongs there. I mean, there's no reasons why appeals, you know, should have to be in person in many cases. Right, I could see maybe um, whatever preliminary inquiries are still left, uh, maybe because- For sure. The incredibility, that would be okay. But yeah. I agree, once you get into demeanor, uh, and and um, to make a decision on an accused in a way that some yep. people sort of uh, personal, personal almost dehumanizes the accused to have him not absolutely there. you want him there to be seen by everybody in. yeah and I think that there is you know for a certain you'll you'll know this too Ian to certain extent to a certain extent that's grounded in reality and sometimes it's not there's a lot of paranoia in our clients about whether or not they're getting a fair trial process. So you've got somebody in another room who, and you can't assess like, are they having an opportunity to read something? Do they have someone in there with them? Is the, is the sheriff that's in that remote location with them, if there is a sheriff um, assisting them in some way that's, that's not legal. Like I'm not, I'm not meaning to suggest something nefarious about sheriffs. Certainly I think sheriffs are fantastic, but managing your client's paranoia around whether or not the whole system is stacked against them becomes a step more difficult from a client management perspective when they can't see the witness in front of them and and be satisfied that this witness is just testifying from their memory as they're supposed to be testifying. So I think that's an issue too. 
do you uh do you find now that everything's kind of all this information about law and stuff is going on the internet um there's been changes in like the attitudes of jurors and and uh also even the people accused on what should be done i don't know i mean ian you've been practicing longer than me so you might have a different uh, a stronger view on this you know i i think there's i think it's you're, you're right it is easier for an accused to try to be an armchair quarterback when they can go on to canley uh or go on to the de any database through the law library and look up cases themselves um there's always going to be jailhouse lawyers that are going to tell your client that things things should be done differently and or, or or your client him or herself might be one and and I think in many ways it's good for the public to have a sense of, of have more access to the law. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think you have to manage expectations differently and you have to take on the fact that your client um, without any legal training may try to seek out decisions themselves and think that certain legal concepts can apply to them. Sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong and you have to be prepared to sort of help them to understand that and contextualize what, What's, what's accessible to them online. You have to, you mm -hmm. have to anticipate that. I think is it what, the, the more interesting thing about um, so much legal information being available online is that uh, some of the way that we do continuing legal education is becoming outdated. You know, for example, people used to come to CBA subsection meetings or um, continuing legal education conferences because they, this was literally a way for them to find out what the law was, right? Mm -hmm. Because they didn't necessarily want to go down to the courthouse and read the latest published decisions. Um, you know, there was no website back then, but now, now you can go online and see in real time, almost any court of appeal or provincial court or um, superior court decision that's published. So, to me, it's important that CLE be more focused on practice and practical things because they just there's no reason for people to come and, 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 and be told what the cases say. They can read them for themselves, and frankly, that's our duty to, to do that. So I think if you want to give meaningful continuing legal education to your colleagues at the bar, you really have to focus on the practical and the how to do it better and the technique and the art form as opposed to just, here's an update on mm -hmm. section eight. Just my thought. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Um, I don't want to keep you too long because we're already, uh, it's already a little bit over time. So uh, no problem. You're probably think, sick uh, of me, but I'm happy to talk, answer whatever questions you need. Um, Ian, do you have any more questions? Uh, no, that was great. Uh, yeah, and I'd love to have you back in the future. Like, it was really sure, uh, interesting, the topics. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, I haven't done it yet, taking a look at, at uh, the product you're putting together and, and, and seeing how it works and, and figuring out more about it. And um, I'm just really um, honored that you had me on at all. So thank you very much for having me as a guest. It was a real pleasure to meet both of you and, uh, and chat with both of you about um, the law and the work that we do. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. If you like this episode uh, and you haven't seen the Ian Paul podcast or the Christopher Hicks podcast, you should definitely check those out. I'm going to link them right here and here.